Okay, welcome to the eSport Research Report. I'm Dr. Brian McCauley here at the Media Management and Transformation Center in Jenshepping in the city of Dreamhack in Sweden. And today my guests are from the Swedish Parliament and even more importantly from the Swedish eSports Association as we're discussing the concept of eSports as sport and the recent news that the Dota 2 international event will not happen this year in Sweden because of a combination of eSports not being a sport the COVID pandemic and a number of factors we'll identify here. So welcome everybody. Uh, maybe Rickard, can you introduce yourself first and tell us your definition of esports? Sure. My name is Richard Norden. Uh, I'm a member of the Swedish Parliament for the Center Party. Uh, I'm a Hearthstone streamer, and I've been advocating esports in the Swedish Parliament for almost a decade now, uh, trying to help the esports community and the esports as a sport to get a yeah a decent legislation regarding such things as visas as we're going to discuss later on but also funding and, and other things and the esport definition is of course you can discuss what is the definition itself is it culture is it sport for me it doesn't really matter uh, for me my view is that esport is going to have a good solid base in the legislation and good funding from the state regardless of the definition. So I'm letting the definition go to other people and I'm going to help with the legislation part. Fair enough, because the definition is different according to who you ask. So Sammy, could you introduce yourself and tell us your definition of esports? Absolutely. And thank you for letting me be here today. Sammy Kajde is my name and I'm the president of the Swedish Esports Federation in Sweden. I've been president for two years now, started at 2020. And when I become president, we said that we needed to carry out a survey and hear the eSport movement about these matters. Uh, what is eSports? What, what are our role in this uh, society? And also, what do we need to focus further on? Uh, and for for us, everyone within the esports movement, it's quite clear that esport is a sport. Uh, a definition of uh, within the definition of sports, uh, and we managed to send in an application to the Swedish Sports Confederation this year uh, to become a member as a special uh, sports federation. Uh, unfortunately, we lost with uh, twenty three votes. Um, for coming in but we're still uh, fighting or what <laughs> i uh, to to manage to get in okay cool like i mean i look at icelandic mini horses you gotta love them jonas uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us your definition of esports yeah uh, my name is jonas Erbe, and uh, i've been you know playing games and esporting for 20 years 21 years 22 years actually and uh, but also got a background within regular sports um, my and I'm a board member for the Swedish eSports Federation I've been that for a couple of years now and also uh, run a couple of uh, grassroots uh, fed you know federation or uh, organizations and also teacher eSports teacher at uh, a school in uh, Onge in Western Norland um my definition is it's more i think it's a lot of up to the, the the soft values when it comes to what is esports or not esports if your in what your intention with your playing is if you uh you know you, you can play a, a esports game but not be doing it like an esporter you can also play uh kind of a, a soft game that isn't like a classic esports game but if your dedication and your resort and your uh, commitment to it is uh, in the right way then i would i would consider it esports so it's uh, it's the soft values that uh, that uh, defines what's esports and that's also what's what makes it so difficult because it's so you can't just say that if you if you play that game then you're an esporter or if you don't if you play that game you're not an esporter it's it also depends on you and what your uh, what your purpose with the with the, your gaming is and uh, just didn't you recently have two of your students uh, playing two player CS:GO Wingman defeat the ninjas in pajamas team in a tournament 
Yeah, it's actually one one of my first year students, and one of my students going to start next year. So it's uh, it's only fifteen years old that uh, they did the, the the Path of a Ninja Wingman tournament uh, so that that Ninja Simpiamos does. So, so it's a, it's a lot of fun, and it's a lot of. Uh, I think it's what we do at the school is really important because for many of these uh, kids, it's the first chance they get to have an adult that actually. Uh, you know, respond to the gaming in the right way. And instead of looking down on it and trying to help them step away from it, actually gives challenges them and tells them what they need to do to, to you know, take the next step. So it's, uh, it's really cool to be a part of that journey for, with these kids. So, yeah, that, okay, that's a good point because that brings me on to a question I wanted to ask. Now, I'll direct this to Rickard. So, Rickard, I'm an esports researcher, and the Esports Research Network has 250 plus members now, and a lot of very high level professors way above me. Most people are smarter than me. But we do find it hard to be taken seriously uh, in terms of applications for European funding and, and you know, the old fuddy duddy professors, as my boss called them. Um, do you find it's hard for uh, other members of government to take it seriously when it's perceived like a children's activity? Or what's your uh, experiences of? The perception of esports in your work. Yeah, when I start, when I started uh, quite many years ago, uh, there were a lot of people saying things like, "Yeah, what is this? This is just gaming. It's yeah, people shouldn't sit at a computer and so on and so on." You know, all these prejudices. Uh, I would say gradually, I've managed to get people more interested. I have b started bringing on colleagues to my stream, starting discussing. I actually had a speaker once. I mean, tapping on my shoulder, asking, do you know, Richard, what is Twitch? Can you tell me? And then I feel I'm starting to get in there, at least, uh, making people realize that this is so much more than just yeah, a waste of time. Uh, but from that point, to actually start changing legislation, it's, of course, a much longer way. I have actually managed to, to get the parliament to behind me in a few smaller things, but we are... Yeah, it's much harder in this broader funding, for example, or putting a label on it to, to know where is it's going to be put into all these uh, policies. That's a much harder work. But I think we are slowly getting there. And the fact also that it's not only kids anymore who's playing, that the generation is starting to grow older and older. I mean, I'm soon 40 and, and I'm a very important uh, voter base for many parties. And a lot of people like me is getting this age, has grown up with gaming. And I think that the parties has to start adopting to that as well, seeing that this is so much more. And the good thing is also there's so many reports nowadays that, that gaming, of course, has some downsides that everybody knows about, but it also has quite many upsides that, uh, yeah, drinking, for example, is it's getting much less in lower ages which is the only factor that you can actually say has an impact is gaming or my mother who's uh, used to be a headmaster in school she said that well the only thing we don't have any problem with anymore among young boys is english because he plays so many games and he know it perfectly my kid who's eight knows more english today than i did when i was probably 10 or 11 due to the fact that he's playing games and watching his youtube so it's so many good things that we can accomplish with the gaming that we should start factoring in as politicians and i think that's slowly slowly actually getting there i mean i just love the idea that gaming is the reason that france won't declare french the eu national language uh you know while the germans try to take them on i mean so we're here because of the dota uh, fiasco or event. So I'm going to ask Sammy to tell us more about the application for esports as sport because I was I'm here what uh, two and a half years, nearly nearly three years, and I was I met you I think two years ago around the first time it happened, and then just recently um, you had your application again. So for anyone who's not in Sweden, you know, because international, what is the process? How can you explain this to someone who would not have any idea about how this happens in Sweden and what happened? Absolutely. Uh, in Sweden, we have this uh, organization called the Swedish Sports Confederation. It's an umbrella organization for all kinds of uh, uh, sports. For example, the Swedish Football Federation and the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation or other sports federations are members of uh, the Swedish Sports Confederation. And the confederation has around uh, 72 
uh, different kind of uh, uh, special sports federations. Uh, the idea with this federation is that it's the members who decide uh, whether you should enter it or or, or not. Uh, so in each two years, they have this general assembly where they discuss other things, but also uh, applications from new federations. And the Swedish eSport Federation has been a part of uh, sending in, in an application uh, to the Swedish Sports Confederation General Assembly since 2017. 2017 was the first General Assembly we were, were uh, up to, and uh, uh, the General Assembly decided to, what is say in English, not withdraw, but to table, uh, to postpone the decision uh, due to an investigation about the criteria for new federations. So every uh, all of the applications were postponed 2000, until to 2019. And uh, we were up the second time at 2019. And there they had four cr uh, criteria uh, that the new federation has to uh, fulfill. The first one is that the, the sport has some kind of physical uh, activity and uh, the physical activity is is more than less uh, you can say the other crit criteria is that you have some kind of competition within the sport and the third one is that uh, the sports give you a uh, good uh, good um, uh, manners or, or uh, well-being yeah. a culture a sense of culture and belonging exactly really, right? yeah thank you thank you uh, so uh, when we were up to it, uh, the the response from the Swedish Sport, Sports Confederation was that uh, we haven't been uh, a, a federation for three years. That was also one of the criteria. Uh, but uh, we had some the physical achievements within esports are not uh, the big uh, part of it, uh, and also. Uh, we have some violent games uh, that are not. Uh, in, compliance, in, in compliance with the Swedish Sports Confederation values. So uh, the, the members said that uh, due to the, the rule of three years, uh, we didn't manage to uh, get a voting and uh, we were uh, sent to uh, be a member of the Swedish Sports Network. Uh, and we have been a member of that network since 2019. So when we came into 2021, uh, we did our best to show the, the members of the confederation that esports has physical uh, parts of it, and uh, that is uh, mainly uh, it's it's not that you you need to do other sports to be physical. Esports are physical, and thanks to you, Brian, and your network, we were managed to put in some uh, yeah. From uh, the, the science, from the science. Of two days, yeah, exactly. yeah, put it together, yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of it, a lot of uh, uh, things there, and uh, so the discussion at this uh, general assembly were rather of uh, what kind of uh, sports uh, is within esports, because esports is a wide, uh, wide. Uh, 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 sports There's so many sports right it's like it's exactly yeah I mean, for example with, with martial arts you have different kind of martial arts and you can uh, define them each uh, for example some martial arts are from japan and some are from korea for example so you're, you're uh, taekwondo and I'm, i was karate i was sado karate and I exactly karate's going, to, karate's going to the olympics now to join taekwondo just just the next one right so it's there yeah. are parallels there okay yeah and I'm also, beside of my work within eSport, a president for the Swedish Taekwondo Federation. So I have one foot inside and one foot outside. But so that was the, the, the response from the Swedish Sports Confederation. But we still managed to get a voting session for, for our application this time. And this time it, it was uh, from 200 voters, 30, uh, 23 uh, voted that, uh, against us. So if they would, come and join our application, we would have been a member of the Swedish Sports Confederation today. Uh, so that's a short version of this special movement with the Swedish Sports Confederation. I know that in other countries, it's the parliament that decides whether you are sports or, or not. And uh, 
and that there is other structures of that. Uh, Richard is more like, an expert of that, uh, so we'll leave it to him. Okay, so Richard, um, can you take over Sammy's point about the government aspects of what's going on, what could happen here with this issue? Yeah, yeah. the problem here is that the legislation is built around a membership in the Confederation of Sports. So, for example, if, if you're holding a, a tournament in uh, ice hockey, world championships, you will automatically get a visa to enter the country if you're from Belarus, for example, uh, a country where we probably wouldn't let people enter as a normal citizen. Um, so you will automatically get a visa because you're an athlete. The problem is if you're holding an eSport tournament, probably even bigger than the World Hockey Games, if you're from Belarus, you will get denied because you're not part of the confederation. The legislation is built around being a member there. Same goes with work permits, for example. We have people from Russia who's been willing to enter to play with the yeah, world-leading games, which is placed in Sweden, who didn't get a work permit because yeah, esports is not a sport and therefore you can't work with it as from a government point of view. So we have the several of those things. Also funding, for example, is uh, it's not part of culture, but it's not part of sports. And then you get don't get a funding at all because yeah, you don't fit into these boxes. So what I, I can't decide whether it should be uh, possible to enter the confederation or not, because that's up to the confederation. But my goal is to put a level playing field so you don't have to enter the confederation to actually be granted all these yeah, positive things, because then you can actually decide yourself if you want to be part or not, because of course there's other network things that could be interesting, but I don't think it's fair when the legislation is actually based around a membership of a confederation that's not democratically controlled. We're actually putting governmental policies, the implication of that on something that we can't yeah, rule over. And that's, I think that's a democratic problem, actually. I mean, OK, so Jonas, as one of my top uh, go to resources for questions I have on esports, because Jonas knows a lot, so does Anton and a couple other people. But Jonas is one of those people I kind of go, Jonas, what's going on? I mean, what do you see happening from here, Jonas? What do you see the options are in, in how to proceed? Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. Uh... I think we still need to, you know, things are in a, in a certain way and we need to both search out how we can change that way. Because if you look at the, the report that Sami spoke about earlier, I'm not sure that the, the, the sports uh, confederation is the you know, it's 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 not a perfect fit for the way esports is. We have been trying to find, and that's that's that's, that's also been one of the most interesting things I feel trying to f find a way for esports to to work together with with regular sports because it's 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 different. It's it's not the same. It's much more democratic. It's much more um, fluent. It's much more. You know, it's it's not. It's, it's hard. Better. It's for better. The... It's innovative. It's bottom up resource allocation. Yeah, well, don't you know, worry, it's we digital don't, based. We don't have these like you know uh, organizations that are, that have five members that are 120 years old, and then we need to keep them alive because it's so old. There's a lot of that around in this in in the sports world where you know it's just tradition, but it's uh, and 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 the best thing about about esports it's it's kids it's both kids that do these things it's the kids that plays it's kids that organize it it's kids you know it's very there's, there's a lot of power for the little guy within esports and you feel and at the same time you have these like big companies that makes these games. And you feel, well, aren't they the ones that decides instead of uh, the sports federation, which we see in regular sports? But it's, um, and I don't feel that way. There's been so many examples of, com you know, big game developing companies that are like, we're going to do an esports game. And the players are like, no, you're not, because we don't like the decisions you made. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, no, but you know, the, which, which, which way should we go? Should we? Should, I think we should need. We need to try 
when now that this is the way this is the way that things are then we need to to just uh, try to work within those parameters but we should still try to see if we can do things in a different way and we have uh, we have we are well looking at options but it's uh, yeah Sammy is the guy that knows the most about that so word over to you Thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, and we have uh, looked at two ways uh, for organize organize esports in, in Sweden. Uh, the, the first way is uh, to become a member of the Swedish Sports Confederation, and, and within that way, you have also two alternatives. Either you you become a member as a special uh, sports uh, federation, or you become a part of an existing sports confederation. The second way is that uh, uh, esports are a global uh, sport. Uh, you can manage to play with your friends from Brazil and be coaching from uh, from your train and have a coaching session with your trainer from USA or, or China or, or another country. Uh, so uh, within the sports confederation, the, the the traditional sports has to have this non-profit structure of it uh, to be, to to uh, play football for example you, you it's hard to play football by your own or, or behind a computer it, behind a computer is easy sorry <laughs> but to to manage to kick the ball and, and score a goal you need to to play with friends or in a, in a team uh, that is physically and geographically based near you uh, but esports are so much more than that, and therefore our other solution is that, um, for example, if you look at the Swedish Olympic Committee or the Swedish Paralympic Committee, they they have a special uh, assignment from the government uh, where where they have to prepare the the athletes for an Olympic Games, for example. Uh, I think uh, the other way is that the Swedish Esports Federation get this special uh, appoint. Uh, assignment to to manage to to support more to become professional esports and uh, more uh, more teams to to go out in the world uh, and also to bring more international uh, big events like the international and also the major that we're seeing here now in in the, in the autumn uh, so there is two solutions and we're working on on them both uh, it's not uh, it's not late to, to become a part of the Swedish Sports Confederation. We have this plan B, uh, but we have also the, the second uh, part of it to, to see what the government can can support eSport with. So you, you kind of maybe, Richard, give him a nudge there. I mean, like Sweden is a powerhouse. I mean, I talk to the Irish eSports Federation and that's only sort of starting. And here I'm in Sweden and I think I have uh, the Smurf toy from CSGO behind me. And he's wearing a Swedish flag beside the Zelda shield there. I mean, this is almost representative of Sweden's position in esports, right? That's, that you were so good at CSGO and you had innovative government policies that said, here's high speed internet. We were, we were seeing ahead of time. Here's a tax rebate if you get a PC. Whereas in Ireland, we were playing PlayStation FIFA. Right, and so Sweden, as and the last paper I saw from maybe two years ago, ranked Sweden number four or five in the world. And yes, now we have a situation where, uh, you know, ends for Finland, well, they're not so good anymore, but you have Denmark and Australis. I got my Australis hoodie in uh, Jack and Jones here in the city. I haven't seen any, uh, you know, Swedish merchandise for me to buy just going down to the mall. So, I mean, there's a danger that these countries may leave Sweden behind. So, Rickard, I mean, what do you think from your perspective as a member of the Swedish parliament that, about this danger of those damn Danish leaving us behind or nor even the Icelandics or you know, the other Nordic enemies? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, uh, that the gaming industry has been, yeah, not good enough in educating politicians how big they actually are. I mean, we are usually speaking about the Swedish music wonder. We'll be speaking about ABBA and Roxette and so on. But the esports and the gaming wonder of Sweden is much bigger. Not only the, the gamers, which has been huge. We have so many world championships in different games. Everything from CSGO to, to Hearthstone that we have won. But also the gaming industry is huge with DICE, for example, and, and so many other companies. 
And I think they also have a work to do here with the legislation to start to start pushing politicians to show that this is real, this is something that's huge, and you have a great chance of of advocating Sweden internationally that you are missing due to to laziness and to old school rules. And I think that's that's important. That's what I'm trying to do, showing my fellow colleagues that this is much, much bigger than you think, and that this is something that could put Sweden on the world scene, or actually are putting Sweden on the world scene, but not not much enough. So I think that that we need much more help, and I need more help to to show that this is not only something kids are doing behind their computer. This is yeah, this is uh, advertising for Sweden. This is a good commercial. This is good export industry. That that is much bigger and something that people are or should actually take into account when they make policies, because this is good money and good value for Sweden as a country, and we should take care of that. Look, as a person from an overachieving small country on the global stage, aka Ireland, like you know Hollywood, music, Eurovision, Sweden and Ireland. I mean, you know, I see the value in that. There's opportunity there, and you guys have a, a step up on a lot of the rest of the world. But Jonas, what were you going to say there? I think we have, have been kind of spoiled as well, seeing that you know we had the the, the, the quick uh, broadband and the, the computers to you know pretty much everybody in Sweden already in the '90s, and we were you know Sweden were we talk about the South Korean like wonder the esports wonder, but if you consider it, what's happened here in Sweden is uh, you know we were we were number one in so many games, and we had you know some of the biggest organization that was like pulling like pushing the 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 whole scene forward and we had the companies like dreamhack and you know we we were just innovating in so many levels and we were doing so much cool but without getting the help from anyone uh, you know and we were like number one i would say sweden was number one even though you know you, you talk about south korea uh, but, but they were they were StarCraft. I mean, they were yeah, but they had, were they were number one, and they had the, because you know the government came in early and and helped pushing. And then what we see now in in a lot of different countries is that we have like, I think it was in like the Netherlands. I heard lastly that they had made the decision that they should use like ten billion euros to promote the Netherlands uh, gaming, uh, game development, gaming and and esports uh, scene. And try to get in more companies and so on because they, they haven't had this like you and you know and then naturally they, they, it doesn't come from beneath and you they try to like rise it from above but it's uh you know we, we've gotten spoiled everybody's like yeah we're it's, it's been doing so great so now we need to uh it's not much you know it's not much that we're asking for it's not the support that we want to help more kids uh, help parents get the, the knowledge and how they could help their kids and you know help organizations that wants to 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 bring the local you know community and the local kids together and and be like a, a beacon for them it's you know we need to help all these people because it's uh, it's getting hard to do it only on the on the backs of you know goodwill and uh, and you know the the, the heart well, my, well, my research projects are all about the uh, local actors. I've got lands, I've got legitimacy studies, I've got uh, DreamHack and the local esports actors because it's something that I recognize as really positive and great. And, you know, we have a Kappa bar here in Jenshepping and moving to Sweden, it was a lot easier for me to make friends when I was able to sit there and go, hey, you like games. I'm a professor in games, but I don't know as much as you. So people could explain <laughs> esports to me as I was a gamer. And you know, it's, it's a culture and the stuff that you do and the work Ricard does and how Sammy supports it and how people like female legends and stuff they do. I've worked at DreamHack, you know, uh, I've talked to the CFO of Modern Times Group. He's an alumni of uh, Ian Shepping University of Jibs here, which is nice. And there's all these great projects and we, we were gonna have student athletes in esports here. And I think uh, Carl Satter Hamstead, one of them is doing the same. And we've got lots of projects happening around that and it just needs that kind of legitimacy. So when Ricard sort of mentioned the, the sort of value in tourism for uh, esports, I'm just looking at the Dota to the international stats. Uh, so it was $40 million and people were 
crapping their pants over 15 million for uh, Fortnite a couple of years ago. That made poof, big waves, right? And so oh, my kid could be a millionaire, but no. Uh, it's $40 million, 89 million hours viewed, and 2 million people kind of viewing concurrently at the peak. And assuming that we're still in this kind of lockdown sort of stuff, that would have been bigger and it would have been a nice little, you can imagine the Eurovision little, you know, the way they show the whole city and those sort of things. I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, so let's see, who wants to who wants to tell me about what's happening now? Who who has the inside scoop on the international right now? Who who knows what's going happening now? Because I certainly don't. So Rickard, I mean you know, maybe you're, from your perspective that it was a visa and a government issue and this came from that perspective. What are your thoughts on the international potentially not being here? Yeah, I would say it's right now it's screwed because all this, the government at the moment, we don't have a government or, or, not, a, or not a valid one that can make that many decisions. So there's no way that they can change the law or make anything that is somehow political because we're in a transition at the moment. Uh, so I think we're screwed in that sense. Uh, I talked to, not to Valve uh, directly, but through other people. And I think it was a shame that they they thought that it was enough to basically send an email to the Swedish minister. Uh, and I think that's, that's a huge miscalculation. Uh, I was trying to help and saying, well, if you do this or if you do that, I can help with this. But, well, it wasn't really interesting. Uh, and I see it as a missed opportunity because this could actually put in in the right way, if they played it the right way, could be a, a big breach in to the government to actually make sure that they see the value. Now it was just, yeah, they didn't do it properly and they did just put out the headlines and it made the news and then it was over. I think that yeah, it's a, such a wasted opportunity because this could actually have been something that we could have shown that this is much, much huger than you think. And I also think actually they talked to the wrong minister. Of course, it was the minister uh, who were, uh, yeah, they talked to Danberg. I mean, Kjell Danberg was the minister that, that has the thing on the, his table. But the one that they should have talked to was the minister of culture and sports because that would have been so much more interesting for her to actually do something about. Uh, and she has said things in the past that could actually, yeah, you could hold her to it. Things that she said that esports is a sport and gaming is a culture and so on. There could have, she could have had a perfect opportunity to prove those words in doing something. Instead, they, they totally miscalculated the thing. So I think it's, yeah, it's too late to save the Dota 2 right now, for this one at least, but in the future, sure, hopefully. Isn't there another tournament, isn't it, the uh, CSGO is going to come with Valve as well? So, I mean, first of all, never send an email to someone with a busy job. I mean, that's just, uh, you know, unless it's an introduction through someone, I always tell people talk to someone first. I even have to tell people in the ERN, no, don't email them. You have them on Facebook. Talk to them first. Go and pop into their office if they're there. Then send the email. That's the, that's just a rule of life for everything. Emails get lost, and the higher ranking someone is, the the quicker the email will get lost. You know, I don't uh, top professors. I don't email them. I hit them on Facebook or wherever hey, I. Hey, you email me, Joe. So. <laughs> yeah, but no, Victor introduced me to you. That was different. Uh, see, that was that was different. I mean, so look, there's another uh, little issue with the whole thing as well is that valve didn't contact for abundant is that something we can talk about here is that this whole issue sammy or jonas who wants to uh take up the the topic of two uh, i don't know what you want to say about that but isn't there a kind of issue of who holds legitimacy i mean i work with you guys so you know what my opinion is but sammy what do you think on that sort of issue yeah, we have two organizations claiming to be uh, the the esport federation in Sweden. Uh, from our point of view, we we were created by esports organizations, non-profit esports organizations, uh, at 2016, and the background from that was that they didn't uh, see any other organization in Sweden who were representing their cause and case. Uh, so they were uh, starting the Swedish Esport Federation and with the goal to become a member of the Swedish uh, Sports Confederation as well. Uh, until uh, 2019, we have been the, the uh, only organization claiming to become a member of the Swedish Sports Confederation. 
but in 2000, uh, 2021 here, uh, we were accomplished with another one as well. And uh, for, we, for us, it's uh, important that uh, who, who, whoever of us that become the Swedish Esport Federation uh, has to work for the esports and for the clubs and has to have a good governance. Uh, that's the main thing. If you're not, but don't you don't you guys aren't you guys the two members part of the European esports? Isn't that from your end? So, Svenska Esports for Wundent is uh, part of the European Coalition for Esports. Is that correct? That's correct, uh, and that's also something uh, uh, we and other organizations were part of uh, in the beginning to to formalize. And when uh, we we came to the uh, in the process to to um, how do I say? Uh, choose whether uh, which one of us should be the the, the organization to found the the esports the European Esports Federation. Uh, we became the, that part, uh, and that was due due to a process uh, of of with many kinds of criteria uh, that has to be filled. And of course, Sweden uh, is very uh, conflict avoidance. It's a lovely country, I, country I admire the most. I've lived in, but there is a Let's not argue. <laughs> let's uh, it's you know avoid the neighbors through the peephole, and let's not have a disagreement. Uh, let's work around this somehow. So the, you know when when there's two applying for sports, does that create a kind of a cognitive dissonance for the evaluators on the Swedish side? Of course, uh, uh, the response from the the members of the Swedish Sports Confederation from the beginning was that oh uh, esports are not uh, together uh, they are divided and uh, due to that it's uh, it's uh, difficult for us to choose whether we should uh, support e either of of those but um, with a lot of information and uh, more uh, focusing on uh, how to say th um, basic things and not that we are two separate organizations uh, they found that, that our application, our federation, is supported by the the, the professional esports team, for example, in Sweden. Uh, we have also uh, support from the esports non-profit organization, uh, and our work is for the esports and not uh, to in include esports within traditional sports. I, I think that's an effect of working for the esports movement and not uh, uh, something that uh, should be our priority. I mean, you know, I always realized that to truly show someone esports, you bring them to DreamHack, or even better, you bring them to Cologne or Katowice, where you have 15,000 people going bananas for CSGO and their team gets eliminated and there's still someone to cheer for and it's not toxic, it's, it's just pure joy over a few days. And even if you if you don't have a clue what's happening on the screens, the, the vibes of the crowd's amazing. So how did the, you know, the awful, pandemic we've all experienced now over the last year. How did this impact everything? Was was that an, a factor in, in how everything sort of panned out in the end? I mean, um, whoever wants to answer that can go for it. I think, uh, you know, the, when they booked these two events, and I say two events because it's two, uh, the international that we just lost and uh, wherever it's going to be held and also the CSGO major. Both of them are organized by Valve and PGL. They are the two producers of the event. And uh, it was almost the same time that uh, both of the events was booked into to Globen in Stockholm. And everybody was like, whoa, amazing. This was before the pandemic. Uh, so this was supposed to be last fall. And they, they postponed it to this fall instead. And I think... Yeah, it's you know this is a direct uh, for the esports players. There's been a lot of uh, canceled events and 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 you know you, you can do this online, but you know those live events. That's what really take the the you know the esports to the next level. Bring a dream act and having the pyro on the stage and having the players walk around signing autographs and you know it's that's. That's the experience. I bring my students down to DreamHack every year, and it's you know when we walk around the first like tour, I I, I walk backwards most of the time just to watch their faces because you know these are kids that the whole their whole life has been gaming in esports, and then they get down there and they they you know there's the big eyes and the mouth and everything. And then so it's not having these live events has been really crucial. 
we've been hanging on. We've been doing better than many other uh, activities, and it's uh, because we can, you know, be online and we can move it online. And we have people that are really uh, inventive to finding solutions. You know, tournaments that send out cameras to players that sit all over the world, so they can have a good camera on their face when they are playing so they and they can bring it into the stream that they're sending out to the viewers so they you know you you still get some of the live feeling but it's not the same so having this and, and you know having these two major events because you know we have dreamhack and dreamhack is like huge every other country in the world wants to have a dreamhack we have the dreamhack but having these two major events in globen it would have been so huge for swedish esports so not losing the, the international it's been so devastating both for uh, you know the swedish and you know the Europe, scandinavian and european dota 2 scene and esports scene but it's uh, so we're just trying to find a solution now for for saving the you know the csgo major and uh, we're, we're going to see if uh, we you know cuz we still have time it's later in the fall and uh, but it's uh, as uh, as richard said earlier they it's they, they they should have I don't know if they were how things could have fallen between the shares so much because you know everybody knows about this pandemic and the rules that we have in Sweden isn't that difficult from other places when it comes to who, who gets into the country and you know countries that are blacked out because they have much spread or not so it's uh, I don't know how, how this could have gone how this you know it's uh, it's, it's such a shame I Look, I have I have two things in sports that are consistent that I experience that are brilliant. First one is when I watch Ireland play an international game of football or rugby because we do the Mexican wave, and uh, everyone in the stadium does it except for the dignitary and VIP box with the president and all those people. So everyone goes way, and we get to the president and everybody we all go boo because they don't do the Mexican wave, and it's so much fun to boo all the important people. And the other moment in sport that I consider fantastic that I've experienced consistently is uh, there's a moment in DreamHack when you have seven or 8,000 people sitting down to do the LAN party and the lights go off. And it, suddenly the place is lit up with the computers and everything. And I guess Shiver's just thinking about it because I, I've seen and witnessed how amazing it is when I talk to people who are like Finnish guy, Norwegian guy, and English guy who used to work together in London and they get together at DreamHack to play for a few days together or the guy saying look one time a year the wife takes care of the kids and me and the boys relive the old days or you know to see the the 12 year olds run around so excited and their dad buying him a burger it's fantastic and you know so Rickard I mean in terms of convincing members of parliament I mean it, it would it be easier if you could bring him in and say just check this out just feel the vibe just just enjoy the love that's happening yeah yeah, I mean, there have been ministers that has visited DreamHack. The problem is, I think, going from there to action, to actually change things, that's the crucial step. And I think you need more commitment than that. You need someone who actually are a bit more dedicated and think this is, this is, this is interesting. This is something to, to put a, some political uh, yeah, vibes into it to actually do something about it. And I think that's that's a huge miscalculation from many politicians. They think that this is nothing. But the thing, but you don't walk past it when you walk down the street and you don't see it, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Because this is huge among m many young people. And you could be, uh, yeah, if you would do so few things that's so easy to do, you would become such a hero. And that's, uh, I mean... I'm streaming once a week or once every second week, but only that as a politician has brought me so many good things. You're like AOC in America. Yeah, I mean, did that. yeah, I, I've been, I've had headlines in, in newspapers from all the way to Russia, to, to the US and so many different things. And it's so, it's so fun. And actually it's one of the few things that actually makes me recognize on the street that I'm a streamer, not as a parliamentarian, but as a stream and streamer parliamentarian, of course. Then, So it's it's actually something that's underestimated, I think, politically. And so many people will actually gain so much from this, both politically well, and also in their spare time, because there's so much good things here. 
it's demographics, right? Because Brexit, yeah. uh, if we didn't know how crappy Brexit was for England, project denial, whatever. <laughs> but the thing is, like, five years, like, a lot of the people who voted leave are yeah. dead. Uh, uh, and uh, there's five years worth of new 18 year olds who are pro Europe and pro everything. And that's just in five years that th those demographics that wouldn't happen now, even with the lies based on demographics. And that's how quickly things can shift. Mm -hmm. So we're going to kind of get towards the end here. So I'm going to ask each of you what you want to see happen with esports in Sweden next. And I think, Sammy, let's start. Let's start with you there on this one. What, what do you think needs to happen from here on in to really continue your work as promoting this wonderful context yeah the main goal is to to have an uh, uh, that's someone acknowledge, uh, acknowledge uh, esports uh, as a sport uh, whether it's uh, to to become part of swedish sports confederation or whether it's the parliament that uh, that says that we need to to support the Swedish esports, uh, we have uh, lost a lot, uh, and the esports in Sweden are losing uh, each day. Uh, now, with the with the, the result of the international moving, uh, we're doing our best to to avoid that Cisco major uh, will will make such a decision. Uh, so, for us, it's important that someone uh, goes out and say that esports uh, are part of. Uh, the sports movement and uh, uh, we're going to help and not just as Richard said uh, saying it with words or uh, we we would like to see actions from now yeah and look 40 year old Brian says there's not many options left for me to do sport without breaking down in tears I'll get to see us go gold no before and then Mark Campbell and the people at the Lero Lab will have to acknowledge I'm highly skilled. But speaking of highly skilled players, Jonas, you former uh, top tier player in two different competitive esports back in the day, back in Norway. What do you think needs to happen? This guy's the most competitive ever, apparently, according to him. He just has to be <laughs> yeah. the best. So what do you want to see happen? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, there's two years to the next time uh, our application can be uh, accepted by the, the sports uh, confederacy. That's just the way it is. It's, they, they have, uh, that's the way they do it. It's, it's every second year. So it's, uh, uh, so that's not, uh you know it's just the way it is we need to find a way to to make it work without them until then or uh and uh i think uh people like richard and uh his friends and enemies in his uh <laughs> in the parliament they need to get online they need to get this uh you know stop uh you know there's there's nothing and there's nothing holding us back anymore, holding them back. We have worked through all the questions, all the kinks. Everything is there now. We just need to get the, the thumbs up, the, the push on the button. And we're going into the an, an election year now, and I think it's going to be interesting because if you see what happened in Norway uh, last time, esports became kind of like uh, an election question where there was a lot of promises made from all over because they wanted to, they saw it as an opportunity to to to, to get votes from the kids, and I'm uh, I'm afraid that will that will happen here as well now, because this isn't a political question. This shouldn't be a political question. This is much bigger than any, you know, side and any, you know, this or that. This is kids, and they're, uh, you know, we need to respect their uh, their interests, and we need to uh, we need to meet them. In this interest, we that are the adults, we need to talk to them. We need to to see what they want to do because it's uh, we can't just like push it down well, on them either. We need you, to you say that right. And I actually spent the last year in lockdown, basically learning esports through CS:GO. And you know, a lot of my reflections on it are that my God, this is so healthy for kids to learn how to communicate, to work in teams. Why can't all these adults I know manage to do this? I mean, it's. It's, it's insane how much positive structures are in place through this thing that you'd experience more in an hour and a half playing CSGO than you would in your average football match because you're so engaged and it's so constant communication. I've listened to Astralis, you know, and you can hear the team speak over the, the game. Now, it happens at my level, it's obviously more annoying, but at the top level, it's all communication and directions. So, Rickard, what, what do you see as needs to happen from here on in? Well... Obviously, we need to level the playing field. 
that the eSport doesn't have to be a part of the Confederation if they don't want to. My goal is actually to make it so that the Confederation is going to beg the eSports to become a member because it's going to be an upside for them. Right now, they are holding all the aces, and I think that's not, unfa not fair. And I'm trying to not make, make this a political question in the sense that it's different parties. I very rarely say that the center party thinks that eSports should and so on. Uh, because I don't think it's the way it should be done. I want more competition in the parliament. I want more politicians to, to fight me over how to, to make the world of esports integrated into society better. So that's why I'm trying to not politicize it as a party politics rather than actually bringing so many people along as possible. And I think that's what we can do. And I, I also think that the, what the esports. Uh, organization the two of them uh, could actually start trying to it would be it would be so good from a political point of view if they can make peace in one way or another and i think that would be better for esports because that's that would stop one argument at least that is against and i think i know it's hard and i know you have, guys have tried uh, but if i have to if i get a wish that would be the wish and then i will do my part of course and try to level the playing field Great. I mean, look, okay, so the way we we do a lot of practitioners here and we do a lot of researchers here and, you know, esports is truly multidisciplinary. Like I'm marketing, but I look at lands and value creation and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Steph, my usual co-host, she's gender and she looks at those sort of things. We've got a paper we're finishing up on sustainability in esports from a social and economic and a health perspective. And, you know, we're going to have a, a conference, an Esport Research Network conference is all on health issues, physical, mental, social, all these areas. You know, there's there's innovation, there's technology, there's, you know, there's it basically it's the most future lab, as Tobias Scholl says, it's a future lab for society. And, uh, you know, it's so applicable with gamer doc looking at injuries and, you know, you've got the Lira Lab in Ireland looking at how training on Playmaster, Jonas, which you know well, how that uh, increases your capabilities and other uh, aspects of life. So basically, um, last question for each of you, and I'll, I'll start with you, Ricard, is um, if you could sort of assign a, a top professor in any discipline, a team of researchers, and you, you got a million euros to send them off and do some research. And not get, I don't have a million euros. I barely have. I, we're not for profit. We have no money. MMTC sponsors this by me saying, I bought a new camera and microphone. Can you give me money back? Um, that's how they're sponsored. Me spending my money and getting it back. But I mean, if you had this money and you had these top brains way beyond me, what would you send them off to do? What research would you like to be done on the area? Oh, that's a very interesting question. I would say um, I would more research into the positive things that comes out of people playing esports. For example, I've seen a few research done with, uh, as you were starting or you were you were touching the subject of uh, teamwork, for example. If you take people who has been playing a lot of games, how do they succeed or doesn't succeed later in life? I've seen some research saying that if you've been part of a World of Warcraft clan, you actually get higher payment later in life because you're better at teamwork. Those kind of research I would love to see to see, yeah, what is true and what is not true, of course, and what could we build more on from a political point of view? What could we enhance more? And what things should we actually try to, yeah, adjust a bit to make it better? I think that's a brilliant topic. And we've lots of researchers here in the in Shepping International Business School who focus on team dynamics and stuff like that. I think, I mean, um, Sammy, what would you like research on? You know, make a wish foundation, your last wish, we grant you a team of researchers led by someone with twice my brains. Uh, I, I agree with Richard about uh, uh, his topic, but also uh, to, to look into what's the difference between esports and traditional sports? Uh, what, what do we have in common and, and what does separate us? Uh, I mean, uh, there is, uh, in, in, in our survey, when we did it 2020, we saw that, uh, for example, it's not uh, quite uh, natural to have national teams uh, in esports. Uh, that is something that traditional sports are are uh, working a lot of uh, with. But uh, and also to how to organize esports, uh, it's not the same as uh, to organize uh, traditional uh, sports. So so that kind of topic is uh, really interesting for us and also interesting in a point of view of how to organize the future eSport federation. 
uh, for us it's important that we have uh, the esports uh, uh, clubs and uh, professional clubs uh, to support the organization uh, whether uh, uh, you I, yeah to, to support it and uh, if you don't have it and still call you an esport federation it shouldn't depend on on that you should have yeah you should look at who is supporting this and and who are you organizing uh, so that that's a topic to send back to you brian I mean, no, I, I like the idea. My nephew's one. I haven't met him yet, but you know, if there becomes an Irish national esports team, you know, I'm going to be sending them so much stuff and bringing them to events and introducing them to coaches early on, so that my nephew will be an Irish international of some sort. I mean, and I also want to see a Europe versus USA Ryder Cup, continental esports, Asia, Africa. You know, we'll let the Aussies and New Zealanders combine. I mean, wouldn't that be brilliant? Like the Ryder Cup in golf. I mean, so Jonas. Um, the guy who coaches amateur teams to defeat professional organizations that rules yeah, you go exactly. legend what would you like to see done as part of future research in esports uh, as you know sammy uh, brian i've read a lot of the i read a lot of research regarding esports uh, mostly because i want to i try to bring it into my uh, you know education for the students and i i, I want to like find some scientific sources for for what i say when i when i when i talk to my students since i don't have a book or math book like a, a math teacher have and so on. but uh and what you richard and sammy said here is great points i'm i uh, and i know there's a lot of great research being done already both on on similar points when those that are presented here and uh, and also um so it's I, i'm not really sure We've already talked to it, talked about it a little in private. You and me, Brian. I'm not really. I don't remember what we, what we, <laughs> what I suggested. I go, I go I want to see more. Uh, since, since I'm getting older, you see my beard here. I want to see more uh, regarding. Uh, uh, you know, we had this wish in, in my friends that when we were gonna, when we was gonna get old, we was gonna sit and play games all day together. And I, I know. Oh. I also have some experience working with like Jennifer, which is a. Uh, what a Warcraft streamer, uh, Warcraft granny, uh, and so on. And, and I think that's actually one of the aspects that also, a lot, you know, this gets neglected. How could uh, gaming and, and, and esports and, uh, and, 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 you know, make elderly more active that can't be like physical active, but still, you know, doesn't get the, the social activities or the uh, stuff like that? Uh, how could, you know, Stuff like that would be interesting to see more research. I, I about, think I'm but, you know, older that's 60s league. Not what we are talking I'm about these days. I'm, I'm uh, already too old to play against 14 year olds. I want I want dedicated 40 to 60 year old servers now, so that these <laughs> quick reactions of these little kids doesn't destroy me all the time as I well, continue to slow down. I have a I have a CSGO server for you. Swedish old timers is uh, the name of the servers. It's only, uh, or, you know, uh, adults. Let's not, no, let's not say elderly people. Let's say adults. Okay, brilliant. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, uh, for coming on the show. Uh, anyone who's uh, watching this on YouTube or listening to it as audio, there are links to uh, Svenska East for Abundant and uh, Ricard's uh, Twitch stream and all the information if you want to know more. There will be contact details below uh, the video, and um, it's, it's available on Spotify and everything as well. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Thank, thank you. you, Brian. Take care.